Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Maturing Your Microsoft 365 Governance and Compliance, featuring our special guest, Simon Hudson, who I'm going to, well, actually introduce a bit later today. My name is Silvio, and I'm a sales executive here at Syskit. Here with me, we have already mentioned Simon, our star of the day, and also my colleague, Yasip, who will be well, showing you a demo of Syskit Point Solution a bit later on. Now, for starters, let's introduce Syskit as a company. Many of you already probably knows us as a company, but yeah, let's, let's do a brief introduction. So we've been uh, on the market for 14 years for a software development company. We develop products for Microsoft 365 governance and security, as well as for SharePoint on-premise, although this is these times are kind of coming to an end. Uh, we currently have more than three and a half thousand customers all across the globe. And those are ranging from, you know, small businesses up to our large corporations with a couple of hundreds of thousands of users. We currently have four products, including our award-winning SP docket for SharePoint on-premise. And well, the star of the day from the product perspective, which is Syskit Point, our flagship product for M365 governance. Now, uh, a few words on the housekeeping here. Before we start, uh, so all reg registrants of this webinar will receive a recording within a few days after it ends. After the presentation, we will have a short demo of Syskit Point, where Josip is going to actually show you how Syskit Point can help you gain visibility over M365 environment and generally help you enforce governance processes. And after that, we're going to have a Q&A session where, well, Simon will be waiting, ready to answer all of the questions you may have. So yeah, just for that, just use the Q&A function on the right side of the screen and ask your question throughout the entire session, throughout the demo, throughout the uh, Simon's presentation, whatever. Okay, finally, it is my pleasure to introduce our special guest, Simon. So Simon Hudson, he's a Microsoft MVP and entrepreneur in residence at the University of Hull. He is an expert in the technology and health sectors. He has background in physics and medical devices and strategic marketing. Wow, there's a lot of strong words here. And additionally, he is expert in Microsoft and all of the related technologies. Also, he's currently a lead author uh, on the growing maturity model for M365. He currently has two active companies, Kinata LTD and NovaWorks LTD. And he's also one of the founders of the Cloud2 LTD company. Well, after this, I would say great introduction. <laughs> I will now give a warm welcome to Simon. Simon, are you ready? Can you hear me? As if by magic, here I am. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me on today. Um, I uh, hope you find this afternoon's session or this morning's session, depending on where in the world you are, because I'm in the uh, useful, interesting, and that uh, you can take away some perspectives that you may not have had previously. Um, let's fire up some slides, because I think that's the way to do this stuff. All right then, so I'm going to take us through some thinking around um, governance and compliance. Occasionally you'll hear me use the word risk as well because Microsoft themselves talks about governance, risk and compliance, but mostly I'm going to look at just the governance and compliance components of that. Um, let's just jump by, that's as easy as anything. There we go. So. I'm not going to go through all of this stuff because uh, yeah, I think I've just had a, a rather excellent introduction. Um, but there are some links on there if you ever want to track me down to accuse me of whatever it is that I've done wrong. I, I would welcome such feedback. Um, the only other things to add is that uh, I also uh, help run one of the longest standing Microsoft 365 uh, user groups here in the UK with uh, a couple of excellent guys, including Simon Doy, who's a uh, uh, recently minted M MVP as well. So that's rather good. Um, but enough about me, let's have a look at the actual topic. This is what we're going to try and cover this afternoon. Um, five main things. I'm going to give you a little bit of a introduction to what we mean, or if I mean, by governance and compliance, and what that relates to in terms of your organization or your business. Uh, because I've run businesses over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, yeah, these are the kind of things that are really important, governance and compliance. Compliance in particular, if we get it wrong, People like me who own companies get to go to jail. So, you know, getting it right is, uh, is a strong motivation. Uh, I'm going to cover what we think the three pillars of governance and compliance are. Um, it's not just about tech and purview. I'm going to take us a bit of a dive into the Microsoft maturity model, and I'll talk to you about that in detail when we get there. Um, Bionics. 
expand the thinking about governance and compliance so it isn't just great tools like the syskit offerings that deal with how to govern your IT estate, but it's also about the, the broader the broader perspective. And then we'll do some conclusions and takeaways and all those kind of things that we'll do at the end of the session. So let's just um, get started. Governance, risk and compliance. It's not just a nice thing. It's the law, and that's important. And while we're on the subject, it's also not security. Oftentimes, having good security is part of your governance and compliance obligations, but security is mostly separate to governance and compliance. So we've got a nice one diagram uh, just representing that bit of overlap. But don't, I'm not talking about security today. Right. These are the kind of things in the broader conversations around governance, risk, and compliance that we ought to be considering. So in the center, you know, perhaps lined around governance, excuse me if I look over to the right-hand side, I copy of the slides are, um, the, um, the governance is often around strategies and policies and processes and your monitoring and also your organizational culture. If you haven't got that right, really hard to uh, adopt a good governance stance. Uh, and then under compliance, there's the laws and regulations and controls and the activities that you're obligated to do in order to be in business or within the market you operate in. And then sitting around the outside, we're going to come back to this a few times, are the things that make compliance governance possible. So that's the people in your organization and perhaps the people outside your organization you interact with, the technologies you use either to support your GNC stance or that expose you to governance compliance obligations. Um, and then the processes that you adopt in order to be able to, uh, to run all that. Also importantly on this slide, there's a, a link at the top. It might even be a live link on your screen, which should take you directly to the, um, the Microsoft Maturity Model uh, page on the Microsoft Learn site. So that's the, um, the document, if you want to call out the uh, I've been involved in uh, in creating. Uh, I strongly suggest that you click on that now if you can, or make a quick note of the um, the URL. Or there's a handy uh, QR code that will t take you right there. So I'll give you like 30 seconds just to grab that if you want. And if not, it'll be available later on anyway. So I guess the next thing is just for me to dive into some kind of definition. So let's just differentiate between governance and compliance. So governance, I'm not going to read out all of these words because you can do that yourself, I'm pretty sure. But uh, in governance, it's about making sure you've got appropriate processes and culture and safeguards in place to do the things that you as a business choose to do. So that will include things like financial controls, HR uh, management, um, security and um, uh, permissions, those kind of things around your uh, IT estate, all the kind of things that make you a good, decent, safe, reliable business. On the right hand side, though, you've got compliance. These are the things you've got to do. These are the things which are either matters of the law. And if you don't do them, you know, somebody with their lawyers will turn up and talk to you about why not. Or oftentimes there are compliance requirements in certain industries. So I've been in the medical device and the clinical industry throughout most of my career. It's quite this weird IT stuff that I do these days. Um, and so if I'm going to produce products or services that interact with patients, I need to make damn sure that I protect things like uh, their privacy and their health records and the good clinical practice and a whole range of things that I've got to be absolutely robust on. Some of those have legal implications, but equally there are uh, market requirements uh, such as quality standards and um, good and best pra clinical practice that I have to comply with in order to be allowed to sell into that market by the market itself. So compliance has these two aspects, the law and the requirements for your market. And you've got to be able to meet all of these things. Um, if we jump down into the Microsoft 365 stack itself, and again, there are more technologies than just Microsoft 365, but oftentimes the 
above to the compliance and the governance are going to make you do certain things within Microsoft 365, such as setting up permissions and safeguards and monitoring and all sorts of other pieces to make sure that you can meet your obligations within 365. The great thing, and we're not going to go into it in great detail in this session, but I do do some other sessions with the lovely Nikki Chapel, who co-wrote some of this set with me, um, about how things like Microsoft Purview do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Microsoft 365 itself does a lot of the security and compliance activities out of the box, so you don't have to do everything. So 365 is a great place to start. And it's not just going to be around Microsoft 365 and IT. So why do we need to do it? Um, well, I mean, there's a couple of drivers in the market. This will come as no surprise to anybody. Um, the amount of data which we generate as a society every year goes up and up, and it's just crazy growth. And so we've got massive amounts of data, and a lot of that data exposes us to compliance and governance risks. So we need to make sure that we've got a good handle on our data. Coupled with that, and perhaps because of that, and the other technology and other innovations going on in the marketplace, we're finding more and more regulations we need to keep abreast of. Um, uh, the USA and Europe are bringing in some fairly robust regulations around uh, AI. Uh, the UK is a little bit more open-minded about the use of AI at the moment, but uh, that'll change if there's any major problems. But you know, we need to be able to keep the front foot of watching what the regulations are because otherwise you could be in non-compliance with the law without even realizing it. So we need to keep an eye on regulations. And then there are the commercial and financial risks associated, associated with not being compliant. And there's some really great stats out there about the number of businesses that do a data privacy breach or have, um, have a security breach, and the number of them which go out of business within um, sort of six to 12 months of that breach. So there's some serious risks of being not compliant. Right, so we're just going to bear that in mind that there are some major drivers and that the executives in your organization are absolutely exposed to that. But in a lot of countries, not every country, but certainly in the UK and I'm pretty sure in the US too, um, if you are the individual who's responsible for some kind of regulatory or uh, legal breach, you are also to be personally at risk of, um, of being hauled in court and being fined or worse. So when we come to look at issues of GMC, not only do the exec make sure they get their GMC stuff right, but you as an individual also carry responsibility and accountability. So I've touched on this, but I'm just going to say it again. The risk of not being compliant for the three buckets, damage to your organization, uh, in terms of your uh, reputation, your ability to sell, operational and financial losses, and direct or indirect fines. Right, let's move on. So there's three core elements to all of this, three underpinnings, if you like, the pillars that let you do governance and compliance. And in particular order, because I think that the order is important, we'll start at the left. The most important thing to getting your governance and compliance right in any organization are your people and your leader. Uh, I think that good organizations, mature organizations, start with that. They make sure that their staff understand that they are accountable. They understand that the processes are there to protect them and to protect your clients. And they establish a culture that doesn't just lip service to governance and compliance. Actually, the really good companies treat governance and compliance as a, a strategic tool that differentiates them from their competitors. So, pillar one is about establishing those people face, facing processes. They will manifest themselves in terms of policies and procedures, active training, guidance notes, people with specific roles and responsibilities around governance and compliance, probably with some kind of oversight role as well, and the ability to report back throughout the business that they're doing it right. And in all the companies I've run, you know, we've had that. We've been able to raise issues at a board level. We've had board level oversight of governance and compliance, and then we've rolled that down through the organization. And we've had active processes for lifting any concerns anywhere within the organization and the staff up to board level. So. Staff and leadership. Second major pillar is the management tools themselves. So what processes in particular 
are you using in order to um, track, manage, and act on any uh, GC, um, uh, weaknesses or breaches? So we typically have, and I have this again in all of my companies, a risk register. We consider where all the governance and compliance risks may be. We take active steps to eliminate or minimize or map those risks. And then we write all of those risks down in a risk register and review them as, at an executive level regularly, six months, perhaps 12 monthly, depending on the class of the risk. And we do do some classification, I'll touch on that later. Um, and make sure that we're continually identifying new risks, writing them down, and actively managing them and allocating those management tasks to individuals or teams within the organization. We then manage incident logs. Um, I did. I do have a clinical company, and uh, I have had to deal with a couple of clinical incidents. Thankfully, mostly not our fault, but there were a couple which were. Um, and so we have an active process where we capture any incidents or near misses, and we go through a similar process of assessing the incident, dealing with it, and then looking at what the learning and prevention for those incidents are in future. So those are incident logs, and then off the back of the things active. Uh, active action plans. I tend to use Microsoft Planner because it's a good, good, good tool for this. But all of our action plans are managed in Microsoft Planner for my organizations. Then there's some other things you need to do. Uh, some of the risks and compliance requirements that you associate are associated with uh, content management. Lots of organizations don't have a great mechanism for looking at their content, their documents and, and other assets and making sure that they're kept up to date that they're expired when they should be, deleted when they should be, or they're reviewed and recreated at the appropriate points in time. So a good position, and certainly a source of non-compliance, is if you've got key documentation in your organization that is not being actively managed, updated when appropriate, trained out to everybody, or removed as needed. Um, there is training and activities and processes around incident and risk responses. We had some very active processes in place for, uh, with some really tight timelines time for what if there's an incident, how can our clients or the regulators themselves get hold of us and trigger an incident, get that escalated to the right people, which would be me in many cases, because I used to wear the senior information uh, responsible officer hat um, and make sure that we treated that as a priority one uh, activity to deal with incidents and risks. And then again, finally, make sure that the auditing and uh, reporting of these things is, uh, is in place. And then finally, I do mean finally, it's the third bit I worry about in an organization, you know, are the technical controls themselves. If I've done the first two things, the technical controls then follow and support these. So this is the technical controls, especially using the Microsoft stack because that's where most businesses have been and the technical controls in there are really good. So, um, so we look at and identify what the technology can do, where the risks areas actually are. We make sure we can figure um, in a lot of detail, the security and the permissions, all of the things I mentioned down in each of the applications that we use. Um, it's not too bad. There's really only a few places in 365 that we have to go to manage that. And then we have a, an active program, an ongoing permanent program, as it happens, to do an active review of all the purview activities and uh, we continually improve our, um, our compliance stance with the organization. I'll show you briefly later on, but this purview has this cool score. The score is arbitrary but useful, and our objective is that every quarter we should have been able to improve our compliance score. And so we have a process for doing that. Right. So those are the three pillars. I think there's a really important takeaway in those. So let's move on to the next part of the agenda. I'm just check. I've got plenty of time. I'm running ahead of schedule, which is super unlike me, but that's good. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, maturity models now. Um, so this is this is a classic maturity model. You'll see it on the Microsoft Learn site. Um, there are five levels to the maturity model that we use across all of the Microsoft 365 stuff. And level one is the base level. Um, it's the kind of level you find with dysfunctional organizations, you find with startups, you find with teams, and it's that stage where you haven't really got proper processes in place and you're desperately trying to get a handle on what you're meant to do and how to make better. 
Uh, it's what I humorously call the rubbish level, because at this point, you really haven't got great processes or great anything. You're just trying to figure out how to do it, and it's really important to away from rubbish level as soon as you can, Get up to level 200. At level 200, you recognize you were rubbish. You're now trying to do something about it. You're putting in processes, policies, procedures, training. You're allocating people with certain roles and making sure that um, wherever possible, you're doing the right things. And you figured out what some of those right things are. Uh, level 200 still isn't good enough, actually, um, but it's a good transitionary phase on the way to adequate. So you'll find lots of organizations who are moving up, scaling up, have started up a new division or business practice and are trying to get better going through this. Uh, we now need to have proper management in place to make us good, reduce the risk, reduce the cost, the errors in what we do. Level 200 still have problems. They still have inefficiencies. They may not have full buy-in staff. They may have pushback from staff, but you're trying. And that takes us up to level 300. Level 300 is good. Um, I think most organizations should aspire to be at least level 300 across almost everything they do, unless it is a low value, low risk activity, or they're still in that scale up phase. Um, and this should be where you're aiming for. So at level 300, those things you've been trying to build at level 200 are robust, tested, engaged with by your staff. You've got great processes that people can see and they know what to do. You've got appropriate management uh, oversight. So you know that if something's changed in the business, you may need to go back and change some of your processes or documents. And you've got some of that life cycle management, content management, and all the other things that, that are working pretty well. Let me just say a couple other things while we're at level 300. It's unlikely that every part of an organization is going to be at level 300 all the time. And maybe you've got great operational processes, and you're really happy with that, but maybe your sales team is weak. Maybe your legal function is doing really well, but marketing needs some work. Maybe you've got a sort of a transitioning uh, HR team, and you need, and you've gone through some staff changes, and you're still trying to embed that new uh, set of processes. So it's absolutely okay for an organization to be at higher and lower levels across different parts of the organization. That would be completely normal. But if you were to look at a, a normal curve, you know, a sort of a, a price distribution kind of curve, most of the organizations should have most of their processes at about level 300 most of the time. So what does great start to look like? Level 400 organizations aspire to be great, and they may pick parts of their, their business functions and go, we need to be absolutely top class in this. So maybe they've got, like Apple, absolutely world-class operations. I've got some terrible things I'll say about Apple, but not on this call. But you, know, you cannot deny the quality of their marketing capability. They're brilliant at it. Whereas Microsoft, Microsoft, bless them, certainly in the past, have frequently drip, dropped down into level 200 with some of their marketing activities. And we see that in some of the branding missteps that they've made, and then they recover. Right now, they're pretty good at it. But in the past, they've not been a level 300, definitely not a level 400 organization in terms of their marketing. But the good ones get level 400. Microsoft are at least level 400 with things like their uh, their cloud computing, their data centers, all that kind of stuff. I don't even make a case that they're level 500. So level 400, really efficient, active processes, uh, using feedback from the marketing processes to continuously and proactively improve uh, what they're doing, actively looking at regulations and making sure they're anticipating what the next set of regulations are going to be and get onto the, foot, the front foot with all this stuff. And then you've got exemplars. These are rocket science and hardly any organizations in the world run any of their level 500 but the ones that do are maybe using things like data scientists to anticipate what needs are going to be against large data sets they may be using ai supported uh, activities to do um, sort of looking at all the regulations. There's all sorts of things that level 500 organizations do. They're absolutely robust in their governance and compliance. They are anticipating moving forward before the market demands it and using those things as a, as a strategic asset. 
So that's what the model looks like. Let's jump into that in detail. Um, this is just an overview of all of the Microsoft Maturity Model assets. So again, if you want to go and have a look, there's a quick link down there. Uh, we've got competencies cover uh, about a dozen different uh, different things that businesses need to be good at, and uh, governance and compliance is at the top of that list. Governance and compliance is the only thing in this list where we, the authors of this model, consider that every organization must be at level 300 or above for governance and compliance. If you're not, you're at risk, whereas the others, it's a business choice. Governance and compliance, be at 300 or above. So there you go. That's just repeating that same thing. Give you a second just to digest that level 300 stuff. though, And then I'm going to jump into these in, um, in more detail. So let's spend maybe five minutes or so going through each of these levels. This is what level 100 organizations look like. And I'm hoping that nobody on this call or listening to this recording is experiencing this. But yeah, there will be people out here out there at level 100. At level 100, they probably aren't thinking about governance as being really important. You know, their, their directors or execs or VPs are going, oh, you know, it'll be fine. It's like, so either not doing governance or paying lip service to it, not really thinking about doing the investments, not telling people to get on and do the right things. So we've got these characteristics on the right hand side in the little writing. So leadership don't believe that compliance is fundamental to their overall objectives. Um, they've got no processes for keeping up with regulations. Their governance, risk and compliance processes and controls are absent or ad hoc or just out of date and not fit for purpose. In practical terms, you may not have a stand place where all of the key important documentation is kept. It might be on people's hard drives or in filing cabinets, not somewhere which is centrally managed. It's typical characteristics of poor governance and compliance organizations, immature organizations. But if we step up, those that are trying to get better start to look like this. You know, the view is that governance and compliance is something serious. That we should do it. But maybe, maybe doing it is at least or only limited to going through looking at the standards and the regulations and ticking all the boxes and making sure it looks like you've done it. And I've seen I've even participated in this occasionally, but more, you know, so just making sure you get a standard or you get that uh, sign off by making it look as if you've signed that. So 200 sometimes fudge the results, but at least they're trying and they recognize the importance of it. So let's just pick a couple of characteristics. You've got some policies. So you've written some policies, but they maybe are not being enforced. You aren't making sure that your staff uh, are adhering to the policies. Maybe the policies are inconsistent. You may have two or three policies that either conflict with each other, or maybe people have got different versions of the same policies. You haven't managed to get your, your document management correct so that people are using all the same version of the truth there. Level 200 organizations may not have done adequate governance and compliance training. And that doesn't mean necessarily training people in governance compliance. It may mean training people in the policies that they're meant to be following. So if you've got a shop floor where they may not know that there are some things they've got to do about health and safety because they haven't been trained in. So you've got to make sure that stuff is in place to go up from level 200. Make sure that the training and other things are there. Let's just pick another one. Um, Often compliance is an afterthought. So new processes or new teams will be created. And it's only after they've kind of got onto the front foot and started developing a new product or or in the middle of putting together the you know the the manufacturing process or something, they go, Oh, have we actually uh, done our, our GNC activities around that? As opposed to designing GNC in from the outset. Um, we often see in level 200 organizations that you use email rather than collaboration and shared content and all the other things to do communication. And, uh, and that would be a, a, sort of a, a danger sign. Let's look at what good enough looks like. Level 300. Um, so level 300, the organization itself, that means execs, managers, and most staff understand that compliance is essential to run their business. You've got a top-down cultural change 
to make sure that people think that way. But it is also a bottom-up acknowledgement and acceptance that people in our organization have to do the right things basically all the time. And the managers in between in those middle layers are, are overseeing that and making sure that people who are you know, coming into the organization are rapidly brought up to that cultural standard. There is at least a baseline compliance framework in place. So setting out the sort of standards, the policies and other things that everybody needs to adhere to and people understand the importance of that. And there is some mechanism for measuring how good the organization is at the compliance activities. It's not enough just to put it in. Level 300 organizations are going and testing those um, processes time to time and making sure that they're still fit for purpose. <clears throat> So, again, we'll just put a couple of these individual characteristics and we'll move on. So, compliance activities, for example, are frequently event driven and use things like audit, regulatory deadlines in order to make sure they're done. So, this would be common for us when I was running my clinical companies. Um, we used to have a couple of things we used to have to do every year. There were standards for the NHS, in my case, that we used to have to re, uh, recertify for every year. And we would use that, we'd say, this date's coming up in end of February. So, here we are in January. We better get on and get those, um, those compliance activities done. And so we would, at this point in the year, kick off a program of work. That's absolutely fine. In fact, it's good. We'd have a diary uh, or a planner that kicks off these events every year to make sure that we may remain compliant. It's not perfect. We'll cover that again on the next slide. But at least we're doing it on some kind of you know, triggering event, saying this is coming up. Let's make sure we've gone through this process. Um, what else? Um, we would do things like look at our risk level and review it and make sure we update it. So it goes to our risk logs and review those probably annually. Um, there might be, and this is a risk, there might be limited or misplaced confidence that all the things that we should be doing, we are doing. And we may not know whether whether we're doing everything that we should. So you know there, there's some gaps still in our model, but we're trying. We'd have strong content management tools. We'd be fairly confident that all of our Microsoft uh, 365 has data's got appropriate controls in place. It may not be perfect, but it's appropriate. And we're starting to use more advanced things like automated tagging and labeling of content to make sure that you know, the right things get dealt with in the right way. So level 300, it's good enough. I'm going to just pick a couple of things out the higher levels and then move on. Um, People culture, the leadership team sees value in continuous improvement of government risk and compliance. Those GRC or GNC activities are factored into business decisions and are usually anticipated at the start of a process as opposed to bolting them on later. Um, there's continuous updates to things like risk logs. You don't wait for that trigger event. You're doing them as people go, actually, that could be better. Let's do that now. So there's a whole bunch of things that uh, level 400 organizations do proactively as opposed to waiting for a deadline to drive it. And as we said earlier, just finishing off, uh, ultimately um, mature organizations, level 500 organizations take a strategic approach to all of this stuff. They use it for for strategic advantage. They have ad processes that look at the data and use those to optimize everything that they do. It's really sophisticated stuff. Right, last few minutes of my piece. Um, so this is the business context. And this is where I make a plea to go back to those three pillars and think about the fact that it's not just that tech. Um, you've got a technology piece. So Microsoft 3 to 5 settings, purview, all that stuff needs to be in place. But make sure that you're extending your technology boundaries beyond just Microsoft 365. So you've wrapped your technical controls around Azure and any other technologies you're using in your business. You are then looking at the corporate obligations you have. How can you use this stuff to make you better and safer from a corporate point of view and uh, taking ownership of not just the technical risks, but the business risks and, uh, and doing that whole sort of that whole set of pies. And you put in place some kind of plan. So 
we said, you know, this is kind of a little bit of a model for how the 365 maturity works. You're going to start off in an ad hoc way. Then you do some assessment and do some uh, maturity uh, design. So you design your policies and your procedures and your people and your technology to uh, put in place a level of uh, governance and compliance you need to get to. And then you've got this virtuous cycle of monitor, identify, prioritize, and implement, and keep going around that in a continuous program. I'm going to show you shortly what we did on that. Um, and if you do have some kind of compliance and, um, and governance, or, yeah, compliance governance assessment, where you go back and get maybe an external person or an internal person with expertise to look at you know, your governance and compliance position across the organization uh, to benchmark. Your, um, your maturity, have you got level 300, and is that sufficiently consistent if we're in the organization? Um, look at any privacy and other regulatory risks with the data you've got. Um, assess your 365 other environments, as you said. Do the analysis and reporting. Learn about tools and services that can help further mitigate risks. So you've got a plan for how you can adopt those going forward and then produce some recommendations and next steps, which can be turned into an action plan once you've got buy-in uh, buy from your executives and other parts of the organization. Um, I'm going to skip this one for now because really it's just passing through this middle three pillars, people, process, technology, and getting you to those uh, recommendations. So I'm going to, in the interest of time, move through that. Just touch on purview though. Purview is a great tool. I really like it. Um, it's got a, a lot of really cool capabilities for managing your 365 estate, but it also gives you some triggers. Do, well, if I'm doing this for Microsoft 365, are there analogs to that that I should be doing somewhere else? If Purview says I should have accountable roles for taking care of uh, you know, logins or, or administrative functions, maybe I should have similar things for my physical assets. How do I control access to the buildings or sensitive parts of the organization, not just sensitive parts of my IT infrastructure. So Purview, it's got some really good tools, but also use it to inform other things you might do in the organization. But I'm going to drop into that comment I made early on about compliance versus security. And this will upset some of the cyber people, um, but um, frankly, security is easy. Um, there's a, a nice set of tools within uh, Entra, as it's now called. So the Entra Defender, uh, I think it's Entra these days, um, uh, toolkit within uh, Microsoft 365 has got about 58 elements, 58 things you ought to address. That's kind of a reasonable number. You can write those down on a sheet of paper and hand it over to the IT folks and some other people get involved. And you literally work through that in the course of some months and get your security stance and your security uh, score up to a decent level. Um, purview, your compliance and regulatory stuff, it's got over 2,000 elements. Yeah, it's two orders of magnitude bigger than your security piece. So you literally can't say, here, governance and security manager, go get this right. There's a different approach to doing um, a program for compliance, and it really is about creating a program of work. And so what we did within my companies, we, um, we allocated roles to people, and we would go through the purview tools and the other tools that we had basically every week and just try and pick out one or two things we might be able to fix or improve and get our scores up. And we would do that every week. Every month we'd review what our total progress was and republish our new upgraded purview uh, compliance score. And then the executives, of which I was one, uh, would then look at that and see on a basis, uh, both in our monthly team meetings and at board level, have we made some movement up the scale on our compliance score this month? If not, why not? And what are we going to do about it? How can we allocate resources and responsibilities to people to make sure that we continue to see improving? So there's so much to do on compliance and regulation that you can't just fix it all at once. You've got to have a program of continually getting it up. That's the takeaway from that. It needs to be board led. Um, it needs to have appropriate resources allocated, uh, and there needs to be some some real in how much you can do in what time scale. I think getting up to from maybe level 300 to 400 is probably a two-year program for most organisations. 
So here we go. These are all the plant scores for one of my companies. Um, uh, we started off with a secure score of 54 uh, at one point, so that wasn't good enough, and I had concerns about that. We had a compliance score at 77, and we went through these two sets of tools, uh, the secure um, score stuff and the client score stuff. And in a period of, there should have been another side in there. I wonder where that's gone. Okay, for some reason it's jumping, it's jumping by, but we managed to get our compliance score up to in the high 70s and then into the 80s uh, over the course of about a year. Uh, whereas we've got our secure score up to high 70s and into the 80s in about three months. There we go. There it is. From 56 to 77. And now we are choosing how good we, we want to be. And we got it up to 82. And I think we said we're not done. We feel at a board level that we're comfortable with where we got to. Right. So practical steps. Some things you should do. Benchmark your current position against the maturity model competency. See whether you think you're at level 300. And the trick there is to look at all of the characteristics in the level 300 and say, is that us? Are we better than that? Are we not as good? And if you're not as good, write that down as an action item and go fix it. Make sure that somebody at board level is convincing the other executives that this is something that's important to do and that the progress towards sufficient compliance is, is owned at a board level. Get your strategy and priorities right. If you have a board-led strategy, you can't really expect your managers and staff to get it right. So it's important that the board actually lays out progress and strategy. Then embed the cultural change that wraps around it. Get a program of change that I just talked about. Um, figure out which things you're going to focus on initially with Purview, because there's too much to do all at once. You just can't eat that Purview elephant. Um, and start to build some other tools. Don't rely on Purview to fix everything for you. And I'm going to show you that right here. So this is my clinical company. We built using SharePoint, and actually our staff access this through Teams, and that's a different conversation. But we built a, um, a, a GRC portal within SharePoint and, uh, and floated it out through Teams. But this is where we managed all of our um, non-technical and technical uh, governance and compliance activities. We tracked all of the different standards that we were obligated to. You can actually see our risk down here, our incident log down here. Um, there's actually no open incidents here. I'm not going to show you it all, but we had about six over the course of the previous five years of incidents that we dealt with. And so I can track that and I show auditors and, and our, our um, staff and our clients that how we dealt with that kind of things. And we were really on the front foot. We were level 400 for things like incident manage, management within the organization. And we've got a risk log over there, all these different things. So don't just rely on purview. Build yourself additional tooling to manage the wider context. We had our training program into the portal as well, all sorts of stuff. Where you should start. This is just a simple priority, but I think it's important. Um, if you look at where your risks and compliance needs are in the organization, and I always take the view out, I look at the thing which is quite likely to happen. And I look at the things which are going to really hurt me or my business, and I prioritize, that, prioritize those first. So this is a, a, a heat-graded um, risk score matrix. Um, feel free to use it. It's in the public domain. Uh, I just use a, a, a low, medium, high, one, two, three score on both of these things. And the things which are high impact and moderately likely to happen, the things that are medium impact and quite likely to happen, and everything above that, we deal with as a priority. So I go back to that previous slide where we took a view on priorities, priorities, and our program of work. We will be dealing with these five and six level activities straight away. Uh, I wouldn't feel safe as a director until we were comfortable that those were under control. And once those are done, I'll move on to the, uh, the, the medium level ones. And the things down at one, you know, the, uh, the, the green zone, frankly, I'm not that bothered about those. So I'm not going to fix those anytime soon. Right. 
Um, just a quick mention of licensing, because if you're going to use the Microsoft stack, you need to understand the, uh, the, the cost implications. Um, the, the short version is that you probably need to have equivalent of enterprise E3 licenses in order to be able to access most of the tools you need within 365 to get level 300 above compliance. So there are some costs there. Um, if you're running on the business uh, business licenses, not the enterprise licenses, then we're talking business premium. But make sure that you've got you know, E3 or above. And mostly when you start hitting uh, maturity level 400 and above, you're pulling through features which are in uh, the uh, the higher license levels, E5 and some of the, um, some of the premium plans. So I'm afraid there are some costs. Right, just some best practice, some takeaways for you. You can't fix it all at once. Don't expect to jump right up, get to level 300, stay by yourself, and then work on those priorities. So crawl, walk, run, that's the approach. And it's based on that risk matrix that I showed. Be realistic, be pragmatic. Make sure that you do things which are good enough, not things which are perfect. Better to have a good enough process that everyone uses than something which is perfect and is a year late getting into uh, into day-to-day -day use. And before you start, look at where you are now. So do assessment, look at where you are, look at the benchmark, make sure you've got a reasonable place to stand before you start to try and do the other one. And make sure you involve all the right teams. That could actually be everybody. Finally, we're in a co-pilot era. Um, I've been running Copilot for uh, a month or so now uh, within 365. Love Copilot, really powerful stuff. There are a couple of risks associated with Copilot. Um, Copilot and associated AI can expose information that you didn't realize was exposable. So make sure that you've got your data governance correct in your Microsoft 365 estate. Uh, if it's in the graph and it hasn't been secured with appropriate permissions, Copilot will find it. So I've got this new variant on Gigo. It's not just garbage in, garbage out. Garbage left in your, your data center, in your 365 stack, can result in Copilot making up nonsense. So if you've got out of date policies and out of date um, sales documents still locking around in, uh, in Microsoft 365, and you ask Copilot to example, produce me a new uh, proposal based on my, my sales documents, it could be using stuff which is no longer relevant. So make sure you've got your um, your, your, your data lifecycle, your content lifecycle management nailed down. So uh, it says Glyco now, that's my new, uh, my new um, um, uh, acronym. Just to remind everybody, Copilot isn't one thing. There are over 200 different copilots, and they vaguely fall into the bucket. So there's a lot of them. So make sure if you're using copilot-based AI, you think about the wider uh, application stack. And are there any other places, not just 365, where copilot could be pulling out things that you probably should have secured? And um, just a reminder, because I like this slide. Uh, AIs are now at the point where, for things like speech recognition, classification, content extraction, AIs are at least as good as people. So it'll find stuff that people haven't found, which is good, but make sure you've secured the stuff that they shouldn't find. Right, so I'm going to wrap it up. Um, let's just finish with, with compliance. I'm going to read this slide. It's not a project, it's a lifestyle, it's a matter of organizational strategy. Start small and grow. Don't just look at Microsoft and definitely look at everything beyond IT. And I'm going to stop there. There's now an opportunity to raise any questions that people may have or challenge me on anything I've said or ask me to expand if you'd like. Uh, yeah, thank you, Simon, for the awesome presentation. So everyone, again, if you have any questions for Simon, just, you know, type them over in the Q&A section. Uh, just before we do that, uh, we're going to give Simon just a short break and we're going to actually employ our friend Josip here to actually do a quick demo on how Syskit Point can help you, well, gain visibility over M365 and generally how we can help you with data governance. Josip, you ready? Uh, yes, I am. Hopefully you can, uh, everybody can hear me. Yep. Uh, great. So. 
something that Silvio mentioned at the start of the webinar is uh, SS Point. This is our flagship product that is uh, that helps you govern your Microsoft 365 environments. Uh, so. Uh, what does SysKit Point help you? And in more details, is uh, if you're uh, regardless of your organization size, and uh, even if your organization deals in a highly regulated industry, uh, Point will help you to get a better, better grip over user access, inventory, and management across all of their your Microsoft 365 uh, workspaces. Uh, you can also enforce different governance policies, something that uh, Simon mentioned. Uh, that was his topic throughout his whole presentation. And uh, our solution will help you with that. And even with providing uh, deep visibility, easy cleanup, control over external collaboration and oversharing. Uh, most importantly, Cisco uh, Point will help you to get, uh, uh, help you to keep your environment secure and your work workspaces properly uh, governed from their creation up until their end of life. So, uh, continuing on, on the topic of end-to-end uh, -end workspace uh, lifecycle management, SysKit Point and the feature it, it, it has will, will, uh, will help support you in all the phases uh, that the work, workspace uh, goes through. So, during creation of the workspaces, during its life, so while the project that is backing the workspace is ongoing, and then the eventual uh, disposal of the workspace once the project is completed, Cisco Point and its features uh, will will help you to uh, to, to manage those uh, crucial moments in a workspace's lifecycle. Uh, so let's go right ahead at the demo and show you what I'm talking about. So uh, here you will see, you see the Cisco Point Microsoft Teams uh, application that, that is actually visible to all of your end users. Uh, from there, your end users are able to see all the workspaces that exist in your environment and can join them if they feel like they should uh, they should be a part of them. But if none of the workspaces uh, do uh, match their criteria or match their needs, they can always request the uh, creation of a new workspace by by providing some details to the approvers, which then hopefully will approve the workspace and the workspace and the new workspace will be created by Assisted Point automatically. Uh, one, uh, there are several features that Cisco Point uh, offers uh, you. These are uh, custom templates, uh, custom multi-step approvals, and uh, naming conventions that are highly customizable by you and your organization's rules and compliance settings. Uh, also, once the workspace is created by Cisco Point, it will uh, automatically ass assign all the policies you have defined inside of Cisco Point so it gets properly governed and secured from its creation. Now, uh, let me show you the Cisco Point web application. And by drilling into the security and compliance tile, we are taken to the security and compliance center of Cisco Point. Here we'll see a number of different policies that are implemented into Cisco Point, ready for you to customize them for your organization needs. Some of them, to name them, are inactive guest users, orphan workspaces, workspaces with too many owners or too, uh, or not enough owners, orphan users, workspaces with shadow users, workspaces with too many members, uh, tenant storage limit policy, and blocked users with assigned licenses. So these are all policies you can turn on uh, in, inside of Cisco Point so that these policies uh, uh, start to be enforced by Cisco Point. For example, we can see that there are currently 48 uh, workspaces with too many owners. By drilling into this uh, into this uh, policy, I can see uh, what which are these workspaces that are violating this policy. And for example, I can see that the Contoso marketing uh, team has seven owners, whereas the minimum maximum numbers uh, that is permitted by the policy assigned to them to the team is five. So. Uh, what happens, uh, what Cisco Point uh, does, it, it detects this kind of vulnerability. It tasks the current owners of the, of the workspace, so Jonathan, uh, Troy, Zachary, and so on, to, uh, to, to, to resolve this violation, either by accepting the risk because they know better, and uh, in fact, seven uh, owners should be left uh, in, the, in the workspace, or by uh, reducing the number of owners to the permitted amount uh, as the policy assigned to the workspace uh, dictates. So, uh, 
right now I mentioned multiple times applying policies to workspace. So actually this is something that you can do in Cisco Point in two ways, either by, by manually assigning workspaces to uh, policies to workspaces or by defining rules uh, upon which Cisco Point will automatically do the policy assignment uh, for you. An example of a rule might be, okay, Cisco, uh, for all the workspaces with the highly confidential sensitivity label applied, please apply the following policies. Uh, so in this way, uh, you do, you, uh, Cisco Point does most of the work and uh, it automatically uh, applies these policies on all the workspaces you currently have, even those that are yet to be created in the future. Uh, now, to show you another type of policy we have, uh, access reviews. Access reviews are periodic reviews your workspace owners are performing uh, in order to uh, keep their content compliant and secure. Uh, and the aim of access reviews is to help in preventing oversharing and potential data leakage, which is especially, as Simon mentioned, important in the day and age of Microsoft Copilot. Where, it, uh, where you might not be aware of all the uh, stuff uh, Copilot can access. For example, let me just quickly guide you through the to a typical access review process a workspace owner might do. So after this overview screen, we are taken to the members report where owners can, for example, manage the owner, um, owners and members of the, of the workspace and, for example, remove them from the group or add new, uh, new owners and so on. The more interesting report is the sharing step, where owners can quickly identify, for example, all the externally shared content inside of their workspace. Here I can see that the HR practices folder has an anonymous access link that is enabling any, anyone with, the, with this link to access all the, the files inside of this folder, something that might raise uh, my eyebrow, for example, if I were the owner of this workspace, and I might do a quick uh, remove sharing link action to clean this, uh, clean, clean this uh, potent, potential da data leakage or an oversharing out, uh, clean it up. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to close and continue later because I don't want to resolve the violation uh, review right now. And in the end, I just want to tell you, uh, uh, so now we, we encountered our project is done, the workspace uh, that is related to the project uh, most uh, most frequently just stay, stays uh, in your environment. It, it, it presents some clutter in your environment. Uh, use, usually it's not accessed uh, like for two years or even more. And Cisco Point has an automatic inactive workspace uh, detection system that will also test workspace owners to make a decision on the fate of the workspace. They can either delete, keep it, or somewhere between archive it and archiving the more uh, means like freeze it in time, uh, preventing any access to it. So uh, and yeah, we, with with this we we have we have uh, come to the end of the demo. I just wanted to mention that Cisco uh, offers you a 21 day trial for Cisco points. So please be sure to uh, to to. To, to get the demo, to connect this with point to an environment and, uh, and play with the features I just showed you and the many more that we have built into Cisco. So yeah, that's all for me. Uh, thank you for listening and back to you, Silvia. Yeah, thank you, Josip. It was an excellent presentation. So now it's time for the Q&A session with uh, Simon. Simon, are you ready for some questions? Yep, sure. Um, so we're we're nearing a bit on the time here, so we're not gonna read all of them, but we're gonna pinpoint some. Okay, so are there further resources slash recommendations for the copilot governance aspect you covered? Right. So obviously, copilot is relatively new, and it's very much a, a <clears throat> evolving landscape. It's actually quite hard to keep up, to be honest. Um, there are some resources. I haven't got those linked easily to hand, but I'll dig them out and make sure that Sylvia et al. have access to those. Um, it might be worth having a look, especially if you're a large organization, at the Copilot Hub, I think it's called. But there's a whole bunch of onboarding resources that Microsoft have created for a lot of organizations, and they are just in the process of getting the uh, the equivalents for smaller organizations. And some of those are 
include some of those governance activities, um, especially around things like data um, security and uh, cleaning your data. So I'll dig some of those out. <clears throat> Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next one is, okay, regarding licensing, a level 300 requires at least enterprise E3, but E3 peer review is, peer review is very basic. Should we consider the E5 compliance setup? Is the increase in functionality worth the additional cost or is it only worth if you want to move to level 400? It's a fascinating question. So my, my colleague, uh, Nikki Chappell, she and I do quite a lot of uh, sessions on GRC together. Um, she mostly de deals with large organizations, enterprise level organizations. And the first thing she usually says is you need an E5 license in order to get all the cool stuff that comes with that around governance. Most of my uh, 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 clients and the companies I've owned have been smaller organizations and I think in a, in a less complex organization you can get away with the EV licenses because you can probably get your arm around the rest of the business and do some of the things that purview at the E5 level could do for you but you can do it semi-automatically so um, as opposed to fully automatically I think it, it depends on your circumstances I'm very conscious that the E5 licenses are not cheap, um, as is Copilot, not cheap. You can definitely justify the cost, but executives may need some help to work out why they should be spending that many tens of thousands of dollars extra. So, um, so start with E3, look at your priorities and your strategy, and if that pulls through the need to do more sophisticated stuff, then you go back to the execs and say, you said the strategy is this, the priorities of this, to do these things, we need these people to have those E5 capabilities. So that's be the way I do it. So the answer is, yes, of course they're worth it, but only once you've justified the fact that they're worth it, you know, and that'll depend on your circumstances. Um, so yeah. Okay, thank you. And I think the last one is we're a bit over time already. So what are the biggest challenges when trying to implement this majority model in other Oh, okay. So, I mean, the biggest challenge to begin with is that people don't know where they are. So the, the first thing is to digest enough of the maturity model. It's really dry, to be honest, but to digest enough of it by looking at those individual characteristics and deciding, you know, are we, where are we at? That's the first challenge. And getting management executive support for diverting resources into that. So, so I think that that's the first challenge. Once you've done that, actually, it becomes a habit. So getting started is the hardest thing. Once it's a habit, as long as you maintain the momentum, I don't think it's hard. You use purview, you just keep chipping away at little bite-sized chunks um, thereafter. So getting started is the hardest thing. Um, there is a bit of a challenge about getting your, your board or your executive team to understand it at the right level to be able to set their priorities as well and not for them to just get focused on certain things. And my, my final risk, I think, that I, I flag is not thinking that doing purview and governance activities is an IT problem. I'm going to tell it, I'm going to be really clear. Governance has nothing to do with IT. IT have got their part to play, but the moment I see an organization says, oh yeah, we're doing governance and compliance, we've given purview as a project to IT, I then have to go and have some fairly robust conversations with their, their, their CEO about, you know, you haven't understood what this is about at all. So it's not an IT thing, it's an everything thing led by executives. Okay, okay, thank you a lot, Simon. Great answers here. So the rest who weren't answered will be answered via email. And I think it's time to, well, slowly wrap up the webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us today. As mentioned, everyone who registered will receive a recording of the webinar in a few days. Uh, Simon, thank you again for joining us today, uh, for giving a great presentation, for answering the question. It was a pleasure having you here so yeah is there anything else you'd like to say to people here before well we I, 
I love doing these things. So thank you for having me. It's, it's great. I think it's also really important that we try and spread the word about you know, a, the importance of governance and compliance and the broader capabilities of that maturity model. We focused today on the, the GRC one, but you know, go and have a look at all the other ones and see how those can help you in your organization. Reach out to me or the, the wider team to, uh, to ask for help or give us feedback. That would be great. Um, and also just to say that the slide deck that I've used today, uh, Silvio, you're very welcome to share that with attendees or post a link to it up on the, on the Syskit um, site so that people can access it. Some of those links that I will share later are also in the last side of the deck, so people can have those. Thank, Thank you. you. We, will, we will do so. Yeah. Um, okay, so if you have any further additional questions regarding Syskit Point, any of our products, the webinar, just reach out to us at sales at syskit.com. It was a pleasure having you all here and uh, well, until next time. <laughs> Take care. Cheers, everybody.